Hello, welcome to my meeting. Today, I intend to show the calculators that I've been using in my practice. Previously, I used to show the calculators when I go to give the lecture to the students above the paramedical students, as well as the postgraduate urology and the uh, undergraduate students. So I bring the whole bunch of catheters that you can see on my table so that they can go through them uh, because I think learning by involvement is important. Um, but I've been putting this off the last almost two years now since the COVID pandemic. So I decided today, instead of delaying it further, to put all this in a narrative in a short video and then I pass the catheters around. And those students who are interested in furthering their urology, they can find out more about these catheters. Okay, the most important catheter, the workhorse catheter is actually the Foley's catheter, usually the size, size 14, size 14 Foley's catheter. And it is a balloon catheter. In other words, you can blow a balloon and you will stay in the body, usually the urinary bladder. So the size 14 latex Foley's catheter is the workhorse catheter for urological practice. Of course, some people may say they put a size 12 for, for females and then for adults who have some debris, some, some men, they put a size 16, size 16 catheter. And for children, you can have a smaller size, uh, size six, or this one is size eight. It comes with a, a, a introducer so they can go past the bubbles urethra. And for patients who have many the catheter for long term, uh, or if they have a, a history of allergy to rubber, they can use a siliconized catheter size. Uh, they can have size different sizes, size 14, this one, size 14. And they can have a smaller size, uh, size six for children, size six for children. And they will also have the silastic catheters. Okay, so this, uh, this is the workhorse. And you can connect this to a, connect the catheter to a urine bag. Okay, once you inflate the balloon, once the catheter is entirely in the bladder, your show is in the bladder, you connect it to a, 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 a drainage bag. Okay, and some patients say, oh, I don't want to carry a drainage bag. So they can connect it to a flip waff like, like this. And, uh, and uh, they can go around. And, uh, and uh, when they want to empty the bladder, they can connect it, they can connect it. Uh, they can release the flip waff. Or when they go to sleep at night, then they connect it to the urine bag. And this also give a chance for the bladder to regain its tone, allow the bladder to fill up and regain its tone. So this is the workhorse catheter for uh, urinary drainage. Of course, we try not to insert catheters and we try to keep the catheters in the body as short as possible so as to reduce the incidence of cot uh, corti, uh, catheter associated urinary infection. Next, we go to the, of course, it's very important to have the patient's collaboration, uh, uh, cooperation, the consent, and also we have to give them a local anesthetic, preferably a sterile, uh, uh, plain local anesthetic gel like this. Or sometimes we have to put it into a syringe and then steer it into urethra. Uh, so, so the procedure is generally quite painless, uh, quite painless, uh, but patient consent and patient relaxation is very important. Now, sometimes we need to irrigate the bladder. Okay, we need to put in, we need to put in saline so we put in the three-way catheter, three-way. So the, the smallest one is size 18 or size 20. So if the patient has got bleeding and you want to empty uh, the, in the bladder of blood and blood clots, small blood clots or debris, you can put in a three-way catheter. Again, it is, a, it is a balloon catheter. We also have a bigger size, size 20, up to 24, I think. And this one is a hematuric, hematuric catheter, hematuric catheter. Uh, in other words, this catheter is unlikely to collapse when you when you aspirate on it. So this is a hematuric catheter. Uh, it's reinforced by metallic rings. And to flush the catheter, you need a bladder syringe. So this is a bladder syringe, okay? A bladder syringe. So you can flush it through the catheter lumen, or you can put irrigation. You put irrigation through the through a normal saline irrigation. You don't need to give citrate or heparin, just normal saline irrigation. Uh, this, this kind of syringe will not 
be useful because the lumen is very small. So these are the three-way catheters, which is very useful for patients with hematuria, example from radiation cystitis, recurrent cystitis, or patients after operation for bladder tumor, or after a TRP. Now, if you just want to do a drainage of the catheter, uh, or blood clots, of debris, then you can put in just a single lumen catheter, size, size, size 12, for example. The lumen is very big, or you've got a bigger lumen, you can use size uh, 16. So this, this is a single lumen. Single lumen, no balloon catheter, the lumen is very big. You put it into the bladder and you can use it to do irrigation. For children with uh, debris in the bladder, you can put a smaller size one, size 10, for example. So these are the single lumen catheters, which are also useful for catheter drainage. Now, what about Strumabibic catheter? In Malaysia, uh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm Malaysian. I graduated from University of Malaya in 1981, and I worked in uh, Kuala Lumpur Hospital uh, from 1984 to 1995, and I spent some time training in urology in the University College London, as well as the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. But basically, these are the things we use in Malaysia. So the, the basic catheter for Strumabibic is the Cystofix. Okay, so Cystofix basically is uh, insert catheter over a metallic trocar. Okay, this is a metallic trocar, it's very sharp, metallic trocar, and uh, we put it into the bladder, and once it's inside the bladder, the urine will come up to here, and we insert the catheter. This is the catheter, we insert it into the, into the bladder. Of course, now it's dry, so it's not easy to put it inside, but... So you put it into the bladder, and it comes out. At the tip. Now, once it's in the bladder, you cannot manipulate anymore because if you do manipulate it, the chap tip will cut the catheter. So similarly, when you want to take it out from the body, you must make sure that the entire trocar is withdrawn from the skin. Otherwise, when you break it, when you break it with the intention of removing the stylet, this end here can cut through the catheter. Okay, so this is a cystofix, it's a very sharp catheter. And it cannot be reused. Cannot be reused. And there's no balloon. There's no balloon, so it, it can fall out easily. Uh, but this is the one that's generally used in Malaysia. The next catheter is the Bart Super Big super Catheter. It is quite a big catheter, size uh, 16, size 16 four list catheter. It is a four list catheter. Okay. So again, there's a balloon there. And it's the same system. This is a huge trocar. Very sharp trocar. We insert it into the bladder. Make sure the bladder is distended by ultrasound or by aspiration. And once it's inside, we take out the trocar and we put in the catheter like so. And once it's inside the bladder, once this this catheter, this catheter is completely inside the bladder, make sure the urine comes out and it goes in easily. Again, you can take out the outer trocar and peel it off. Okay, peel it off. So this is the this is the bath. Super big police catheter. It's like 16. So after two weeks, you can easily change it. The patient can change the catheter. So for long-term drainage and for patient's comfort, or if the patient has got a urethral stricture or some urethral obstruction, this is a good way of draining the bladder. Now, some patients who like to still allow the bladder to function. Uh, so this is another type of super big drainage. Actually, it's used by the pediatric surgeons or the general surgeons. This is called the Mickey, the Mickey, the Mickey catheter. There's a small balloon at the tip. Okay, small balloon there. And so th this super big catheter will not fall off, will not fall off. And at night time when the patient goes to sleep, you may take off the cover, take off the stop valve here and connect this, and this can go into a urine bag. So this is another way of uh, draining the bladder for, for sort of a relatively long term, like long term is over a few months while the patient's uh, pathology is worked out. Okay, now what about drainage? What about intermittent catheter? Okay, there are some patients who cannot pass urine for whatever reason, they have chronic retention. Then we do what's called clean intermittent catheterization. That means the patient himself passes the catheter. The patient passes the catheter, uh, a single lumen catheter into the bladder to empty the bladder. So they can use size 10, size 12, depending on the patient size. Some, some of these catheters come with a codet tube so that you can enter the bladder easily. And for the female, you can use a short catheter. 
Uh, they come in all kinds of formulations. You can order these from the internet very easily. They come sometimes together with lubrication. Sometimes you have to use some lubrication. And for the pediatric, you have the smaller catheters, huh? smaller size catheters. So this is clean intermittent catheter. We don't use a four-lease catheter because the lumen of the balloon catheter is very small. The lumen is very small, so it drains very slowly. Uh, and uh, of course, some patients are allergic to, to rubber. Uh, depending on the, the financial, financial background of the patient, sometimes we can use disposable catheters. They come pre-loaded pre with lubrication, sterilized, uh, already sterile, and they can be used. So clean intermittent catheterization is a very, very useful uh, adjunct to drainage of the bladder, drainage of the bladder. Okay, what about other catheters that we use for drainage? Now, if the patient has a, has a hydronephrosis, pyonephrosis, they require drainage. They can also be drained with a catheter, but usually not a four-lease catheter. Uh, we can use a catheter that's inserted uh, by percutaneous means. For example, this is a, this is a the pacer kind of catheter introduced. There's a hole at the tip. Okay, so the, the guard, we can put the guide wire in first. This is the Mallicott catheter used for long-term superbibic drainage. These big catheters are usually inserted by open surgery. This is a smaller one. This is a hole at the tip, so we can also introduce it percutaneously. And, but generally speaking, nowadays the catheters which are introduced percutaneously are of the pigtail variety, yeah? pigtail, pigtail variety. There's a hole in the center. We put a guide wire through. Of course, we puncture the system first and we dilate it. And if we want to drain to the front, we can put an extension, cap extension cable like this, this extension cable. And of course, this can be all be connected. Uh, these catheters usually come with a Leo lock. So you need a Leo lock to U-in back connector to connect, connect it. And sometimes they come with a mechanism which lock the catheter. So, so, so sometimes it comes with a set, complete set. With a complete set with the guide wire, with the introducer. And, and once you have introduced it into the system, so it comes with a stiffener like this, introducing the system, and you can lock it. It comes with a lock, you lock it. So once it's locked, so you take it off, you take it off like this, okay? So you, you want to remove it, you have to unlock it, okay? Okay. So now it's locked. You cannot pull it out. You can't pull it out unless you unlock it with a coin or some device that is provided with the patient. Okay, so now it is stuck like that. You, can, you cannot remove it easily. So remember that to remove these catheters with this kind of lock system, you have to unlock it. Some of them are simpler. They're not so complex. They're just basically a pigtail. Okay, you can insert it with through a guide wire at the tip. So these drainage catheters are very, very useful. When you do open surgery for the kidney, especially if you have Done something to the ureter like a pyeloplasty. Sometimes you need you need this kind of this kind of nephrostomy drainage. The tip here will drain the renal pelvis, and this will go into the bladder. So this used to be called a Cummings catheter. Now, of course, we do the surgery in younger and younger children, and the new catheter is called the Kiss catheter. Uh, the kidney kidney uh, internal stand drainage system, Kiss Kiss catheter. So this these catheters are used for drainage of the urinary tract usually inserted into the renal pelvis. Of course, you can use it to drain any collection like urinoma and things like that. Okay, now. Percutaneous renal surgery is very important. Uh, percutaneous insertion of a tube into the system is very important, example vascular system. So it's very important that uh, in, in endo urology or in interventional radiology, we are able to puncture the system. So this is a, this is a, this is a set, this is called the dilatation set. So we can puncture, we can puncture the system with a micro set, or we can use a puncture needle, and then we have a series of dilators. Uh, 
uh, starting from 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So once you have dilated the system, then we can put in the drainage catheter, or we can dilate it further if we want to introduce a, a nephroscope, for example, into the system. So PCNL, percutaneous nephrolithotripsy, has been around for about 20 years, and it has really, really revolutionized the way we handle uh, upper tract pathology like stones or upper tract tumor. So traditionally, we use this system. This is called the implants, implants, implants renal dilator set. Okay, this is a plastic disposable dilator set that comes of different sizes. And usually, when you reach the end, uh, maybe like for example, this one. I think this one is size twenty-four. So once we have dilated, there's a hole in all the dilators. We leave this unplugged shift in, in situ, and we put the nephroscope through here. Of course, nowadays people are talking about mini, micro. Ultra, ultra micro, you know, PCNL. Uh, but basically, it's the same principle. The same principle. So after you have finished with the dilatation, oh, before I forget, these dilators are very expensive. They're meant for single use. So another system is to use a balloon, a balloon dilator, yeah, a smooth balloon dilator. Or we can use metallic dilators. I don't know want to show because they are kept in the operating theater for reuse. Uh, so this, these are the these are the balloon balloon dilators which can also be used, uh, and at the end of it, of course, you have to leave in a, 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 a tube. Uh, although some people do tubeless uh, PCNL, you leave in a nephrostomy tube uh, with this. So this is a special nephrostomy tube with a hole in the center, and if there is any bleeding from the tract, you can also fill up. You can also uh, uh, you can also dilate this balloon so that it reduces the bleeding from the from the PCNL. Of course, if they have a lot of bleeding, you, can, you have to ask the interventional radiologist. Now, next, I want to introduce to you the idea of the double J stand. Okay, the double J stand. JJ. One J. Two J. Double J stand. The double J stand. Okay, this is the famous double J stand that the urologists used to use plenty. Now I almost I hardly ever use it. So it comes with a stiffener, stiffener, and then of course this goes through the guide wire, la, guide wire. At the other end, there is the, 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 this is the sharp end that goes into the upper ureter. And this is the blunt end that stays in the, in the bladder. And it, it's usually come with a suture, which you can take off if you like, but you can leave it so that you can remove the catheter, remove the jet stand uh, in the clinic. Just pull on it and then the catheter will come up. Uh, or if you leave it there for, I don't know, one week, Two days, you can just remove it in the cleaning instead of bringing the patient to the theater. And of course, this double J stand is a huge, huge industry, and, and it comes with all kinds of ideas. Ah, uh, the taper tip, uh, the better floor, uh, coated with hydrophilic, back, uh, coated with antibacterial, antifungal uh, markings, and uh, and so there are many, many kinds of uretic stands. Uh, uretic stands. Uh, so I show you some of them now. Uh, Sometimes they come complete as a set with the cat wire, with the introducer. Okay, of course, then it costs, costs a bit more, like, no? costs a bit more. So they have different sizes, uh, different colors, different materials. Uh, so all kinds of uh, all, all kinds of uh, uretic stands, huh? uretic stands. And of course, we are of different heights. Of course, you can estimate the size that usually is maybe 24, like, no? So so they have come with multi length, multi length at the end. So you can leave this in the bladder. Of course, if you leave so much in the bladder, it's caused a lot of irritation. Patient with a stand, what I call so-called stand disease. Okay, and then there are, there are other types which you can use. It comes with a pusher. Different stands of different sizes come with a different size pusher. So make sure that they are aligned with each other. And then uh, for patients with cancers, uh, in Malaysia we have a lot of cervical cancer. So if they have a radiation uh, stricture, then my favorite is to use a pure salastic. Uh, eight French, eight French uh, uh, stand, which is a bit short, uh, 20, 22 or 20, or 20, so that not too much of it is in the bladder trigon. So this basically to bypass the, the ure uretric structure, usually in the lower ureter. And if there's a tumor, of course, in the stand, the urine flows inside if there's a tumor around it. So if there's a bigger internal lumen, it's better. So these are the so-called tumor stands. So if the patient has a pelvic tumor. So the, the bigger section will be in the pelvis. But mind you, 
if the tumor is fibrotic or post radiation, it can be very, very tough to reduce these stents. Eh? Very tough to reduce stents. So there are other stents which they, which they, which I use. Eh? For example, they have the thermosensitive memocaf, which they can use for uretric uretric strictures or cancers, and it comes it comes preloaded. You just put it in the scope preloaded and they are thermosensitive so if you put uh, if you if it's cold then you contract once you put warm water you will, you will expand and some people also use it for the prostate prosthetic obstruction patients not fit for surgery or patients on anticoagulant or whatever reason or whatever reason uh, and uh, this is called the, the memo cave i think it's still quite extensively used uh, in, in in the world previously th maybe 30 years ago i, I put in quite a number of this called urolome urolome I think they use it in the heart, I first use it in the heart. The, the problem, of course, is that there's a lot of tissue in, in growth into the urolome and at both sides. So subsequently, they get end up with strictures which are even more difficult to treat because it's very difficult to remove a urolome which is inserted in the body. So now, let's now talk about the double J stand. What about single J stands? Huh? Single J stands. The single J stands, we use it. This is a single J stand. Single J, one J. So, so this will be in the renal pelvis. This will be outside the body. So if I do uh, I look at it, for example, if somebody with uh, cancer cervix, double radiation, chemotherapy. So, you know, there's a, there's a risk of, of, uh, of ischemia of the anastomosis. So this is called single, single J stand. Uh, the other name is called Banta stand. And of course, the single J stands, you can also insert it into the body percutaneously. And the other end, you can connect it to a drainage, uh, drainage bag. So these are the stands that we use. Of course, before you put in a stand, a catheter, you need to image the system. So this is the ureteral catheter. Ureteral catheter, this is the workhorse. Open end ureteral catheter, five French. So you put it at the ureteric orifice or wherever you puncture, and you, you connect this, you connect this end to the, this is the connector, open connector, you connect it, you tighten it a little, and you inject contrast, inject contrast. But this open end is blunt tip. Sometimes if the stone is impacted, it's not easy to bypass the stone. Uh, not easy to put a wire through. So some of the other catheters, this is called a cobra, cobra catheter. Okay, cobra catheter, and this is the sharp end catheter. It's sharp end. Okay, so this can sometimes help you to maneuver the guide wire up. And this is the catheter that has got door channel. It's a door channel two channel, double channel. You can put in two guide wires, okay? So one is a stiff guide wire and one, the other one is the working guide wire. And uh, if you encounter a stricture, you encounter a stricture, proximal, uh, before you reach the stone, you can also put in a balloon dilator. Okay, you can, you can dilate the ureter to access to the stone or the whatever pathology is there. Nowadays, some surgeons do what is called RIRS. In other words, they, they pass a urethral uh, uh, urethroscope into the kidney uh, to try to clear the stones. And if you have too many passages through the kidney, you, through the ureter, you can make damage the ureter. So you and you put in what is called a urethral urethral excess urethral excess shift. So we, we put this device. So this is the inner cannula. Okay, so you have you have opacified the ureter and the pericardial system with the guide wire. You put this through this lumen here. There's a lumen at the tip, and you slowly advance this thing into the upper ureter. So whenever you pass the ureteroscope, you don't need to. You hopefully you don't traumatize the ureter. So this is the ureteral excess shift. The next most important thing that urologists use for any interventional. Uh, doctor use is the guide wire. There are many kinds of guide wire. Right now, the workhorse guide wire for most urologists is the rod runner guide wire. Rod runner is hydrophilic. Okay, it's disposable. Once you put it in water, it's very flexible. Uh, there's I think about 15 centimeter flexible tip, but because it's very slippery, it's not so easy to handle. So I'm for myself. I usually once I have put the rod runner up to the upper calyx or the wherever I want to put it, I will exchange it with my workhorse, the Benson, the Benson guide wire, okay, the Benson guide wire. Now, of course, these guide wires also come with a device for you to talk the guide wire. So you can turn the guide wire 
so that we can find a place to bypass the stone. Now, if you go to the internet, you'll find that there are all kinds of guide wires. There are so many types of guide wires, okay? The zebra guide wire, hydrophilic guide wire, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, many of them are quite costly, like quite costly, but, but the guide wire is a very, very important part and uh, try not to reuse the guide wire because when you use it the second time, it doesn't function as well. Okay, now some other candidates that we use, many of the patients nowadays live up to very old age and uh, sometimes they have incontinence. Uh, it's not easy to give them medication to stop the incontinence because sometimes incontinence may be supratentorial. We put in uh, what's called a condom catheter. So this is a condom, okay? condom with uh, adhesive, put it around the penis, make sure you don't cause the paraphimosis and you connect this to the connect this to a urinary bag. But sometimes elderly people, they will, they will pull it off. So another device is, 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 a, is, a, is a condom catheter, but it comes with a cuff. So you inflate it, it cannot come off, okay? Inflate it. Of course, make sure the pressure is not too much and make sure you give them a catheter holiday, you know? So that there will be no ischemia of the skin and the, cause, cause the pressure sore. Uh, sometimes, some patients, we have very mild incontinence, you can, put a clamp, a penile clamp, penile clamp, and you can just adjust the pressure so that they have they reduce the amount of urinary leakage. Uh, whatever the cause, for, the reason for the incontinence, either post radical prostatectomy or neuropathic bladder. And then, I think urine diversion for muscle invasive bladder cancer is still very common. And uh, usually, uh, a, common, a common operation done is the ileal conduit. So they come with a urostomy. So urostomy bags usually come in two pieces. Two pieces. Eh? One piece, this is fixed to the skin, fixed to the skin, and the other piece is connected to the connected to the uh, the, 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 the piece connected to the skin. So it's a two-piece urostomy bag. Uh, usually, if it's a urostomy bag, they will come with a wife here for you to empty the empty the urine. Empty the urine. Okay, now I got a, a few more small things to show you. Uh, as, as urological surgeons, as transplant surgeons, we often call by the nephrologist uh, if they want us to insert catheters for chronic dialysis. So in Malaysia, we have a huge population of patients. I think something like 50,000 patients on hemodialysis. So for acute dialysis, very often the nephrologist or the anesthetist, or sometimes they call the urologist, and we insert, we insert a, we insert a, uh, catheter, uh, dialysis catheter. Nowadays, we usually insert it into the internal jugular. Okay, internal jugular. So, so this actually is a straight catheter. Usually, this is for subclavian, but we usually don't use a subclavian now because there's a very high incidence of subclavian vein stenosis, making uh, giving rise to hand swelling later on. Uh, later on, uh, occasionally we put it into the femoral catheter, but usually this is usually done by the nephrologists themselves. But sometimes, for whatever reason, we may be called upon to do this procedure. And these are temporary catheters. Usually maximum they use in Malaysia is three months, although it's meant only for two weeks. The next catheter we put in is called a perm calf. Perm calf. Okay, I'll show you some perm calf. So perm calf, as usual, we will have to dilate with puncture under ultrasound guide. Uh, it may be done by anesthetists, may be done by us, may be done by interventional radiologists or by the nephrologists. We through ultrasound, we puncture, and then we dilate. Then we dilate some more. Depending on the size of the, of the perm cap we use and the size of the patient. And this, again, they are peel, peel away. They are peel away. We peel away, and then we insert, we insert the catheter. The catheter is actually quite a big catheter. This catheter I call perm cap or semi-permanent cap because it has a decron calf here which after two weeks will form fibrosis. So you can't remove, you cannot remove it easily. You won't fall off so easily. But again, the, the puncture is quite big. The puncture is quite big and you push it in through here, push it in through here and you peel, peel it away, peel it away like that. So, so this, is, this is tunnel, it comes with a tunnel, it's tunnel under the skin on the chest wall and like so, okay? And you just tunnel it under lock, lock anesthesia. Lock anesthesia, you tunnel it. This is, uh, this is quite sharp. This end is sharp end. This end is a sharp end. So, so this is the sharp end here. And we turn under the skin into the, usually into the internal jugular. Sometimes, 
we can put into an external juggler. So this is the perm cath that we use. Uh, in my hospital, I help the nephrologist or the, or the anesthetist to this, to, to this part. So we do it together. As I said, we have a huge population of patients on dialysis and some of them do not have enough, I do not have good vessels for, for, for uh, doing a arterial venous fistula. Uh, about 30% of patients on chronic dialysis should be on, okay, so if they don't have a suitable veins, sometimes we put in a graph, okay? We put in a graph. Uh, although usually nowadays, I prefer to refer them to the vascular surgeon uh, to put in the vascular graph. Uh, I think generally speaking, we try to avoid using graph uh, because they are also often associated with infection, with thrombosis. So we try very hard to use the patient's vessels only when there are no graph, uh, then when there are no suitable, ve ve suitable veins, uh, then we go to using a graph. Now the next uh, chronic dialysis modality is the peritoneal dialysis. So for many, many years, this has been my workhorse. Okay, this is my workhorse. Okay, so this is the, this is the, this is the connector to the, this is, this is connected. So this is, this is the two cuff, two dacron cuff, one with multiple holes at the end here, on this end here. So this end will go into the renal pelvis. This is outside the peritoneum. This is under the skin or two centimeters from the skin. So this usually is set under local anesthetic. Um, the problem with this catheter is that sometimes the tip will migrate. The tip will migrate. So it migrate to a non-dependent position, for example, in the upper abdomen. So then the patient will have a problem emptying the peritoneal fluid, the dialysis fluid. So, so quite often I change to this type of coil, coil catheter. So there's a coil on one end into the, renal, into the patient's pelvis, huh? pouch of Douglas pelvis. Again, there are two, two calf and they are preformed neck. So it's called a swan neck. This is called the, this is called the swan neck, preformed swan neck catheter. So these catheter are quite useful for peritoneal dialysis, can be said under local anesthesia, but if the catheter tip migrate, then we have, we have to do a laparoscopic um, to push this, the, tip, the tip back into the pelvis and maybe put one small nylon stitch to the back of the bladder, to the pelvis, so that it will not migrate. And again, of course, all this is, all this peritoneal dialysis in developing countries we often associate infection, especially fungal infection, and then the peritoneum is inflamed and fibrotic, and we cannot use it. Of course, nothing better than doing a kidney transplant. Okay, what else? Yeah, I got one last thing to show you. Okay, uh, now we have, we are, even in Malaysia, we are having an increasing number of patients diagnosed with prostate cancer. We have many robots in Malaysia now, so we have a lot of radical prostatectomy going on. And of course, the biggest complicate, well, what, <laughs> one of the complications is that of, uh, of uh, urinary incontinence, and the other one is uh, sexual dysfunction. So this is, this is a penile implant. This is a penile implant, okay, penile implant, okay, penile implant. This is another, another type, another brand, different sizes, different length. These are the semi manageable penile implants, which we insert, usually we insert two, like insert two, usually we put two. Uh, on each side of the corpora carpenosa and, and the patient will have a permanent erection. Eh? So when you go swimming, they have to push it down, eh? push it down, push it down. This is the malleable, malleable implant. So it's soft. So when you want to have a erection, you just really pump it up. There you go up, okay, you pump it. And there's a, this is connected to reservoir. The reservoir will be connected into, well, in, in post-radical prostatectomy, there's not much space to put it. Maybe you have to push it higher up. I think this is a reservoir with, with a fluid inside, usually saline inside. So this is the, implant for, for sexual dysfunction. Uh, usually we, I call them end-stage penile failure, end stage penile failure. Of course now with Sildenafil or Vigra, we, we do less and less of this. And then we have urinary incontinence, which can be treated by various modalities. And one of the most important modalities is uh, artificial urinary splinter, AUS. So this is the urethra. This goes around the bubble urethra or the, or the bladder neck, okay, bladder neck. So this is under tension all the time. So when the patient want to pass urine, he press on this button here and the pressure drops, okay? And then the patient can pass urine. And the, the, after it's finished, you will refill up by itself slowly from a reservoir, again, put in the retropedion space. So I think folks, that's about all I have to show you. Uh, I will pass these catheters around uh, to my students and they can play with it. They can search more about it uh, on the internet because this is a time that we cannot actually meet face to face that easily. Uh, I'll be happy to have feedback, uh, any uh, comments, 
Any ideas? Anything to share with me? I'll be more happy. Uh, thank you for your attention.